for the fourth talk in our series charting the 50 years of Art Basel, we're looking back to the 2000s and more specifically to the launch and the development of Art Basel in Miami Beach. In the late 1990s, Art Basel ranked already as the premier global art show, and it was strong enough to envision a huge next step, which was taking it overseas. And after some consideration, Miami Beach was a city that was chosen. Now, as much success as the fair had in the long run, it had a very rough start in that the first edition was canceled in the aftermath of the World Trade Center attack in 2001. But once it launched in 2002, the combination of Swiss precision, American drive, Latin flair made the Florida fair singular within the art world, quickly, quickly establishing it as the leading show in the predominant art market, the United States. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by three people um, who have all played different roles within, the, the, within this, this development in Miami Beach. I'm joined by Ella Fontanales Cisneros from the Dominican Republic, um, Norman Brayman coming in from Miami and Sam Keller coming in just down the road from me in Basel. Um, so what I'll do is I'll first start with the questions. Um, I'm gonna start with Norman. Um, Norman is an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, an art collector. He and his wife Irma have been cultural and civic supporters for an innumerable number of causes and institutions for decades. Most recently, they funded the construction of Miami's Institute for Contemporary Art, a museum which opened in 2017 and is free to the public, bringing great international artists from all over the world to Miami. Um, and as we'll discuss in a moment, Norman played a decisive role in bringing Art Basel to Miami Beach, serving as the event's chairman until 2018, when he startled me by resigning on stage. But we always knew that Norman would always would do things in the right way. So he, he didn't want to give me a chance to try to talk him out of it. Um, Norman, uh, thank you very much for joining us. You started talking to Art Basel's director at the time, Lorenzo Rudolph, I think in, in, about start bringing a fair to Miami in the mid nineties or so. What was the thinking around this? What was the logic? How did you feel about this as someone who of course had a long history as a collector? What did you think about the idea of bringing the Swiss fair to Miami Beach? Well, uh, Mark, we were, uh, Irma and I had been attending the art fair in Basel for many years. And we developed a relationship with the then director of the art fair, Lorenzo Rudolph. And we started putting the idea into his head, um, Renzo, why not a second fair in the United States? Um, June is the traditional month in Basel. Why not one in December or January? And, and after a while, uh, Lorenzo promised that he would visit Miami. And I think he came to Miami in 1998, somewhere around that time, loved what he saw, and went back to Basel and persuaded the board, well, why not come to Miami? Why not a second fair uh, six months after? Uh, I, I felt, and we all felt, not just myself, but other collectors from Miami, I wasn't the only one going to Basel. Uh, the Rubels were, um, Ella uh, was of course going, and Marty Margulies and a number of others. And um, the decision was made to come to at Miami. And I felt it would be, number one, a, a wonderful to have a major major international art fair in the United States. It would be a tonic for our community in terms of the arts. And, uh, but you know, it, it's, it, you know, that was only the beginning of the, of the story. <laughs> the challenge, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, uh, the cancellation due to the tragedy in New York, but there were other factors as well. We had an art fair in Miami called Art Miami that began a few years earlier and it was patronized by uh, a number of the major galleries. It turned out to be a failure and, uh, and the major galleries were very, um, were very dubious about coming to uh, Miami. Sam will attest to that. Uh, Lorenzo Rudolph had moved on to, uh, to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and Sam Keller uh, was selected to 
to replace them. And we're same, the, you can get into this, we had a great deal of difficulty in persuading the major galleries to come. And, um, and uh, uh, Sam was, was, was on top of this. Uh, other, other of the major collectors in Miami were. I, I, for example, Pace uh, had been at Art Miami and left Art Miami and they, and they didn't want to come here. Well, those of us that had relationships with the galleries persuaded them to come. Sam uh, Keller in his usual persuasive manner was also successful because we recognized from the very beginning that for this to be a successful fair, um, it had to A, attract quality art, which meant attracting the quality uh, galleries who would attract the quality collectors and make it a commercial success. And then we had a great deal of difficulties here in Miami. Uh, art Basel uh, originally wanted the fair to be uh, in the middle of January. And, um, and uh, that date just wasn't available because Art Miami still had that date reserved. And we had a, a great deal of, uh, of political friction here in Miami, which fortunately uh, the, the mayor and others became involved with. Craig Robbins played a major role in securing that date uh, in December. And, um, and the success of the fair uh, speaks for itself. The, all the museums that have been founded in Miami, the Perez Art Museum would not be here. The ICA would not be here. The Bass Museum would not have received the public support and financial support from the city of Miami Beach. So all this, but, it's, but people have to remember, it's a, it's a commercial, it's been a commercial success. It's been a tonic for all, for the community, for the collectors, for everyone. And, and of course, uh, Sam uh, came to Miami, very limited. Uh, Bob Goodman and uh, Stephanie Reed, and I think Sasha were about the only ones that came from Basel to assist Sam in terms of, of putting this fair together. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it, this fair in Miami would be a perfect case study for the top universities, uh, top business schools in the United States as, as in terms of it being a success. Um, uh, Sam will remember we had a great deal of difficulty um, uh, persuading UBS to be a sponsor in Miami. And uh, Irma and I had connections with UBS at that time with, a, with our local representative in Miami who played a major role in persuading UBS to come to Miami. So it's a, it's, it's a great story of, of, of a community of leaders, Neeson Kasdan, Kasdan, George Gonzalez, the city manager, uh, Nancy Liebman, from a political, Craig Robbins played a major, major positive role in this. And of course, the empresario, Sam Keller, um, who made it all come together into the success that it is today. Um, I'm gonna segue from that to Sam himself. Um, Sam, you were, you, you of course, if, I'm, if my math is not wrong, you started working for Art Basel 25 years ago. Um, and of course, you were, I, I assume you were with Lorenzo when he first went to Miami um, and did a lot of the exploratory trips. But in 2000, as, as a very young man, you were, you were given the reins of Art Basel. Um, and um, you took the fair, took over this project in Miami, um, which of course was supposed to launch, I guess, two years after your, more or less two years after you started. In the end, it was three years. But I mean, as, as Norman said, this was far from an easy thing. I, I know just anecdotally that there was an enormous effort that had to be made to convince the hotels in Miami that Art Basel Miami Beach was a good thing because they didn't imagine that this Swiss fair could fill enough rooms. Of course, now we know it's, it's you know, under normal conditions, it's, it's the, the most full, most occupied sort of catalyst of, of traffic for the, for the hotels. But even, even they were convinced that, or weren't convinced that they should put aside rooms for the people that were going to come. So, Sam, tell us the story um, of how 
what from when you took the over art basel to when the fair actually launched what you went through what were the obstacles what were the hurdles who were the allies you know i give you the mic um, I think it's only we only have one hour, so it would take days or weeks. <laughs> so I I think what no, what Norman said is so true. This looking back, everything makes sense, but we looking forward, um, it was a tunnel, and we didn't see if ever there would be an end to it, and sometimes we didn't see light. And I remember often coming to Norman to his home or to his office, desperate, and uh, thinking that for every obstacle we overcame, there were three new ones coming. And um, um, as without without Norman, uh, this this fair our boss will never be in, in Miami. But it's important to say it was a collaborative effort. It was a collaborative effort of community leaders, of, of collectors um, in Miami. You have mentioned uh, many of them, uh, Norman, and there's would even be more uh, to mention. And it was um, from, um, from the side of, of the company that owns our Basel. I don't know if they had any ideas what they were getting into. I had no, certainly no idea. While I had been at our Basel for s several years as a communication manager and deputy di director, you have to imagine this company has never done any um, any such thing that branching out into another country, but to uh, to to make uh, to make this in another in another continent was kind of a wild adventure, and we were more like a startup and uh, sources apprentices who um, were just trying something. It was not about just bringing Art Basel to Miami. It was clear from the time that Lorenz and I um, uh, came to Miami, you couldn't plant, take something out that has been grown over decades in, in Basel, Switzerland, and just plant it into Miami. It had to be something which was specific to the, um, to the place. And it was really a marathon until um, we got there. So um, just, just in, in 2000, we finally got the, gre uh, the green light from the board of trustees and we got the, the, the contract with the convention center who, believe it or not, didn't want us. And it was, it, it was Norman and other members of the community who convinced them it would be in favor of the community. Um, we had to develop a concept um, for specific to Miami, also a concept that would be new um, um, in, in the art world to convince them. They were already in 2000, way, way more first than one could uh, visit. So why, why another one? So it had to be something unique and special. And, and while it had to have some of Basel quality, our Basel qualities, it needed to have a lot of new um, elements. And um, yeah, um, we, we had to bring the dealers. Norma mentioned there was a lot of hesitation while some of the galleries that were participants of our puzzle were the first one to come up with the idea that we should look into Miami, which was not an ob obvious choice at the time. Um, Ursula Klinzinger and, and for example, David Judah and some of them who saw the potential. It was still very hard um, to, to convince the, the galleries. And we, would, we, we also wanted to have it more American and more Latin American. So we also had to bring in new, new galleries. The concept uh, we, we developed then was also um, not just to do a convention, um, uh, at a, a fair at the convention center. We had as a, um, from Basel the experience what the impact could be on a city and its cultural life. So we wanted something that would be done together with, uh, with Miami and for Miami. So it was also to have open source concept where we would only um, create the core, but then um, the, the, the city would participate. And one of the new elements was that collectors would open their private homes, something which was not at all 
part of any um, 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 art fairs or biennial before. And it was the incredible generosity and hospitality of the collectors in Miami uh, who made that possible, which now is part of every art fairs uh, program. And um, another thing was it was not usual to be outside of of, of, the, of the building and to have as, as sculptures in the parks and to have um, concerts and to have um, events in the design district and to have so many people in, um, involved that we quickly lost the oversight of, of everyone doing something. And Stephanie Reed was doing this incredible job to bring, um, to bring everyone together despite their different interests. I think that was one of the things we had uh, we had to go. And finally, we needed the collectors. We knew we only had one shot. And if the, uh, and if the first fair would work, the galleries that were convinced with the help of the uh, Miami collectors to come once, they wouldn't come back if it wasn't a success. But it couldn't have been a success only based on Miami collectors. So we really made trips across Latin America, across um, the US, all over Europe, and we got great help from the Dela Cruzes, who had great uh, um, collections. Um, of course, Ella, um, um, but also let's not forget Eugenio Lopez and other of those who believed in the idea and said this could make a huge difference from art for art from Latin America and for uh, for the artists. And um, I think. All of those elements uh, together, it took us some years. And when we finally were there, 9-11 happened and we had to do it again. And <laughs> we knew by then it would, it would be worse to, uh, to, uh, to go, to, to, do it, uh, to do it again. We were convinced, but it was a hard blow for the company also um, to lose so much money in the first year, but it kind of created a burst miss. Yeah, Sam, um... A lot of people don't realize it, but there actually was a kind of shadow version of Art Basel Miami Beach in 2001 because people actually came, right? I remember, like, I, I don't, I, I didn't come because I was a journalist at the time. It didn't make sense to go to a non-fair, but I mean, the catalog was printed, you know, and then it was sent out and people came. So maybe just briefly, because that's, it is sort of a part of the history. Like what happened in 2001 when the fair was canceled? I mean, I remember you and I were talking about it up till probably the middle of November, early November. So a month before the fair, you're forced to cancel it, as we did, for example, with Hong Kong this year. But what happened? Like, Because I, I know people came and people still have fond memories of that sort of non-fair fair week. The art world wasn't what it is now at the time. And um, to buy a ticket and to have a hotel reservation um, was still a lot of money for a lot of people. And many people have been looking forward to it. Also imagine um, how depressed everyone was after 9-11. It was a dreadful mo uh, moment. And um, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of people still said, you know, we can really, we were so much looking forward to go to Miami, let's go anyway. And of course there was not 10,000 of people who came, but there were several hundreds. And the collectors in Miami had done this incredible, um, uh, uh, planned these incredible dinners and tours in their collection, and they still went ahead. And there were, so it was a couple of hundred people who had an art fair without an art fair. And actually many of us still remember it. We made um, as, as a very pleasant moment to discover Miami, to discover the, um, the collections in Miami, and to spend quality time together as a community, as a community in Miami, but also as a community in the art world was something very meaningful and I have such fond memories and I still have um, uh, friends I made in that week. And um, um, I think it, it, the people who, a couple of hundred people who came were so impressed that they contributed to the, to the, to, to the vibe and they contributed to the kind of buzz that went out. Yes, um, let's, let's go next year. Yeah. So the next year, the fair actually happened. And I have to say, I'll, I'll admit, I'll put my hand up right now and say, Art Balls in Miami Beach sounded like it couldn't work to me when I heard about it as a journalist. It's one of many times that I've been wrong. Um, and I remember coming to Miami Beach. It was my first time ever there. And I think I landed on the day of the opening party. Um, and it was... 
And then there was a bus trip, a huge bus of us went out to the Dela Cruz's house and they'd opened their house. And at the time, the Dela Cruz contemporary collection didn't exist. So the, all of the work was in their home. And it was just kind of amazing, surreal, warm evening. And I think for many, many people, you know, the, the collectors who were lucky enough to be invited, the journalists, the other VIPs, it was the first night in Miami, you know, and then I think the next day, Positions opened. And for those of you who don't remember Positions, which is now in the halls, was actually an innovation that Sam and, and his team had done, where they put young galleries in shipping containers on the beach, maybe 20 of them or so. And that opened before the fair opened the next day. And so um, I think the combination of this great evening that ended, you know, at the Dela Cruz's by the water in Key Biscayne, and then the surreal but effective opening of these Positions things, you know, a lot of people said they don't, by the end of that second night, so the end of our first 24 hours in Miami and Miami Beach, a lot of people who had been skeptical, including myself, said, wow, this could really work. This is, act this is interesting because the whole art world was in a very different kind of location than what we were used to. Um, and I think that created an amazing dynamic. And as you said, Sam, um, uh, we, you and, well, I was a journalist and you and, I, you and I had a lot of conversations about this. And, and you know, I think there were two aspects of why Art Basel went to Miami Beach. One was because Miami Beach lay within the most, most important market, you know, since the Second World War for art, but also because you sensed that the Latin American collector base, the Latin American artists, the Latin American galleries were going to be incredibly more important, you know, and, and I know you had to, you know, you had, if I remember correctly, you had to look at receipts, you know, from the, you know, from Bell Harbor to show that how much money was coming in into Miami from Latin America. And there was a real sense that something could, could grow there. Um, and I'll use that to segue to Ella. Um, Ella, you know, you've, you've been, you know, you've been a collector for decades um, and your focus, you know, with your various institutions and, and with your other activities, supporting curation, et cetera, has been on Latin American art. And I think it's, it's safe to say that in addition to the sort of momentum that Latin American art had in institutions and biennials, in the late 90s, the establishment of Art Balls on Miami Beach in 2002 had an impact. And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective as someone who's really pushed this particular stream of art, what was the impact, you know, of the, the Art Balls on Miami Beach and the attention that it brought to this, to this sector? Well, to tell you the truth, Mark, for us and for me particularly, when we heard that, you know, that Miami Art Basel was going to be Miami. I had my doubts too, like some of you. And uh, we started by opening MAC, which was a uh, Kunsthallen to bring to Miami uh, ex exhibition from around the world and to hire, you know, the, uh, uh, the exhibition uh, space in Miami. In 2001, we thought that we will open for the, for the opening, you know, of our Basel and we worked very hard because we were remodeling the place. And of course, it never happened. So when 2002, uh, our Basel opened and we opened with a, with a show of, of William Kendridge, we thought, okay, we have invited a few people and you know, this is going to be more or less uh, you know, a nice evening with maybe a thousand people, 500 people, I don't know. We were thinking on a small basis. Well, it happened that 4,000 people came to the opening. And at that moment, I thought, wow, what is this going to change Miami? This area is going to really bring something new that we never even imagined, you know? And, uh, and I thought at the beginning, because of my connections with Latin America, that the public was going to be more or less friends from Latin America and so forth. And it was, it was completely wrong. It was a mixture of a lot of people from different parts of the world, from the old United States. From, I mean, it was a, for me, it was a surprise. To, to let you also think about of this, you know, as a collector, I never thought that I could open my house, you know, for strange people to come, you know? It has some, something strange to it. So I thought, well, I have a public space, I can show uh, my art through that public space, but never at home. And one thing that I learned 
through the generosity of people like, you know, the cruises and all of them, that that could happen and that that could help other people also think about the fair as a homey place more, you know, it became like at the beginning, like our Basel was home, was not a strange foreign uh, fair coming to the city. It was like our fair, you know, it became like Miami fair. I don't know how to explain that, but uh, through that, I think most of the collectors started opening, you know, we started opening our houses for people to come and a lot of Latin Americans came later on. I think it was, it has been a process. It was a process for Latin Americans who always were coming to Miami as a fun place to be or a shopping place. It started to be a cultural place to come. I think our Basel changed the perspectives of the city in many ways. And not only Americans, Latin Americans started to come as an, a place to enrich themselves with art. Art Basel uh, really made not only a change in the city, in you know, the, the tourists and the hotels that open and all, it changed our minds, it changed our mentality that we could do better in Miami, that we could do better shows, better exhibitions, more curated exhibitions. And that attracted all these people that culturally were looking at something like this. And in Latin America, I think the idea of having a fair close to home, I mean, it was different to go to Basel, like Sam was saying, you have to buy a ticket, you have to go, you know, it's a, it's a Spence, and you have to really be very interested in what was happening there in Europe. I don't know because I don't know exactly the numbers, but I think that our Basel Miami became a, 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 as big as Miami, our, ba uh, uh, our Basel, Basel, than it, wa it was. I mean, all these new people that probably were not going to Basel for the shows or for the, for the fair, are really coming to Miami. I mean, it's it's a, a new world, I think, that was happening. Even the Asians, I mean, sometimes the Asians to go to Europe is, a, you know, to come through the United States is easier to go to the fair. I don't know if you have that numbers and you can give us that, but I think that complete the uh, uh, allure of the collectors and people like Norman and, and many others really make the fair homey and open. It changed through the through the years, you know. The last year, you know, fun and a lot of other things. But at the beginning, I thought it was like, like that, a homey, nice, you know, culture. Yeah. Mark, yeah I mean, it, go ahead, Mark. You 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 mentioned Rosa and Carlos de la Cruz. Not only did they establish the standard for real hospitality, but they were probably the the foremost and oldest collectors in, in, in our community. And, and Rosa ate it the bedded by Carlos all the time. You know, reach the standard and look for a standard of excellence in this community. And uh, I, I think that one can really call Rosa the, 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 the guiding light of, uh, of everything that's happened in, in Miami in terms of the success of the fair. But the, the key standard, which I don't think exists for any other standard, the last fair, last December, there were 27 other auxiliary fairs in mm -hmm. Miami at the same time. Everybody, everybody hooked on to the success of, of, of Art Basel Miami Beach. And, and just, so it's not only just the one, but the, but the hospitality of the community, which we promised, Sam, uh, would, would occur here. Uh, the opening of, 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 of the collections, the opening the special, uh, the, the, the special shows by the local museums in terms of the quality aspects are just undefinable. I mean, what's interesting, Norm, is the Dela Cruz is also, if I'm not mistaken, were the first ones to say, 
as much as we're willing to have people at our homes, now the collection and the activities have outgrown that. And then they established the Dela Cruz Contemporary Collection in the design, in the Miami Design District, you know, after which we had the, well, m most recently, the, the huge Rubel Foundation um, space, which opened in, in, um, in, in Alapata. Before, before that, you had the Perez Art Museum by Herzog and Demeron. And I think um, we saw a shift over time from, from you know, people receiving at home to then people also establishing freestanding institutions like Ella's CIFO, for example, in, in, um, in the southern part of Miami. Um, and I think it's, it's been really interesting to watch. You know, on the one hand, I think the, the collectors, the private collectors were the, one of the driving forces and distinguishing factors for this, for this fair week. And over time, they they established institutions. You know, as as did you and Norma in supporting the ICA as well. So I mean, I think it's sorry, you and Irma in supporting the IC the ICA. Um, you know, so I think it's been really interesting to watch this development. I mean, I mean, Norman. You know, and it's a question I'll ask to all of you because you all have different perspectives. But since you've been there the longest, I mean, if you think about the before and the after for Miami, Miami Beach before Art Basel and, and after, sort of what are the big things that shifted within the city's life? Not just in the week, but in the whole, you know, overall. Norman? I, I'm sorry, Mark, I, 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 I missed your question. Oh, the question was, was when you look at sort of the, the, the before and after in Miami and Miami Beach, before Art Basel, Miami Beach, and after Miami Beach, how did the city change? How did it shift? Over that, you know, over the last twenty years, it, 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 that's a great uh, that's a great question because it changed the whole topography of, of the area. Uh, I mean, for example, the the the, the areas the, you know, you know you mentioned the design district, you could mention Wimwood. Now you can mention Alapata. These were depressed areas of the city, and because of the art fair. And, and everything that developed from it, uh, these, are, these, are, these today are two of the most sought after areas in, in, in our community. But, but what it did to Miami, Miami went through a very difficult time in the 1990s. There were, the, the publicity worldwide of Miami was terrible. There were a number of incidents regarding tourists that were attacked here. And, and the front pages, um, uh, I remember it was either Time Magazine or, or Newsweek Magazine. The headline was Paradise Lost, referring to Miami. When the fair came to Miami and people came to visit Miami, they saw a different Miami than was written about in their local newspapers or what they heard. And they saw a, a community, a dynamic community. Yes, a community that had problems, but a community that was dealing with the problems. So the fair changed the entire image of Miami. It led to, to there, there's so many people that came here for the first time that over a period of years established second homes here in our community that came here with their families for vacations. I think Ella can, can even amplify even more from the people who came here from, from South America, from Central America, and established residence here. People came from, from, from Switzerland, from, from Europe, I can, I can name a number of them, that bought uh, residences here. So it, it changed the image, it changed everything, uh, it changed the topography, it changed. Um, and, 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 that, and the benefits for that are still going. I, I remember uh, telling Sam and telling Lorenzo Rudolph that, that one, of the, one of the major problems was persuading uh, Art Basel to come here and accept those early December dates. They were worried that it was too close to Christmas, it was too close to New Year's, and people wouldn't travel to Miami again because of that. And we said, hey, there's advantages. It'll be easy to get reservations at the restaurants. Hotel rates will be inexpensive because that first week in December was traditionally one of the slowest weeks in terms of commercial activity at the hotels. 
And, and it was that way for the first year. And, and you mentioned, Sam mentions the galleries. Galleries like Gagosian didn't even come here the first year. Some of the major ones skipped it. When they heard about the success of the first fair and how well the galleries did that came here, that's what brought them the, the, the second year. And then all of the other auxiliary fairs piggybacked, as I said before, on the success of the fair. So it's made Miami, it's, it's, it's just made Miami, I believe, the art capital today of, of, of the United States and, 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 and the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Well, from your perspective, um, from the perspective of someone who is, who is you know, active and living in many different parts of Latin America and obviously has contacts all over, how did, you, how did the perspective on Miami shift? I think that uh, at a at a time uh, at the beginning of the South, I think that people, you know, saw Miami as a as a tourist place, a, a nice place to be for the summer, and that was it. Also, looking from Latin America, you know, even the Mexicans, you know, the Mexicans were a group of people that were always going to California, Texas, never to Miami. Suddenly, our bustle comes. All these Mexicans arrive. Now Miami, it's there's a big community of Mexicans who have, you know, brought spaces and big houses, and and it's incredible. So I think it, it moved people. It shifted the idea that Miami was just a fun place to be or a shopping space for Latin Americans. It became like this is the place to be. This is the place where things are happening. And we, we've seen it. We've seen it because new businesses have come to Miami. A lot of people moving right now with all of this pandemia thing that's happening around the world. A lot of people have become residents of Miami. A lot of people from New York moving to Miami right now. If Miami or Basel didn't give uh, the city this allure of the place to be, probably they would be traveling or going to another place. So I think that it's, it, it was a, a big change, a big change uh, that you could touch and feel, you know. Yeah. Sam, you, you said before that you wanted to go to a place where you could have an impact, and clearly you had an impact. And I'm curious, at what point did you feel that Miami was, was, was changing as a result of the fair or in conjunction with the fair? Um, let me go one step back. Um, when I started to come, my first trip to Miami, the, my friends in Switzerland were, and in Europe, they asked me, sure, what, what are you gonna do there? And um, they were also scared of going. They thought it was a crime zone. Miami Vice was the image uh, Miami had. This is the uh, TV series we've all seen here. And that's how we imagined it. Drug barons, um, uh, uh, kleptocrats, um, um, uh, yeah, attacks on tourism, um, Elias, uh, um, uh, can't count the ballots, and etc. etc. It was it really had a bad uh, image. Maybe like Colombia had for many people who'd never been there. We went and we said, well, what a fantastic place. It, it has a cultural uh, um, heritage. Morris Lapidus, uh, it has great um, architecture. It has creative people. It has major, major um, 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 collections uh, which are there. So I think uh, the expectations were low and it helped that they were lower because once people came, they saw it was a great community. And I think the one thing that our Basel helped to change in Miami uh, was democratization of art and culture. I think for many people, it was still perceived as something that, you know, New York, New York or Chicago or Paris. But yes, um, we can have that as well. <laughs> and I think as a lot of people had access for the first time to first-rate art and um, by seeing the excitement this could create, started to also support art in their local community. And I think um, that is, um, is an impact 
um, that is very substantial that um, our Basel had on Miami beyond the, everything it did for, for tourism and real estate, etc. And Norman rightfully said the image also. I think um, um, the, this thing was went way beyond Miami. It had an impact on other cities. We had calls by dozens of mayors um, who wanted to have a Art Basel in their city. And um, not just because uh, it helped the, the tourism industry, because they, they could really see that it was, uh, it could be a catalyst in cultural development. Yeah. If you had to think, Norman, of, of one thing that made Art Balls Miami Beach so successful, what do you think it was that, that really made it work? What's the, what was the biggest success factor for you when you think about this? You know, you were talking before about, about it as a business case, but if you were going to point to this, why, why do you think it was so successful and so quickly? Because, uh, Mark, it, 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 the, the ingredients were of success, as I mentioned earlier, were, were bringing the, the best quality art to Miami, which would attract the collectors who would, who would and, and also provide the contacts as well for the galleries. December, the, the, as I understand it, the, the, the galleries basically basic business in December, January, February, were probably the lowest times of the year as far as their profitability and their volume and their sales. So Art Basel at the beginning of December was a tonic for them, a shot in the arm as far as business is concerned. You know, this is a, the, the, one of the things that amazed me at the beginning, I discussed this with Sam because I was worried. I, I, was, priv I was privy to see the financial statements of Art Basel Miami Beach by the company in Switzerland. I was horrified at the losses that, that, the, that Art Basel, the parent company was taking. But it was, it was an investment that, that you, Mark and Sam and the board of MCH decided to make in this particular fair, build the foundation build a foundation so the galleries would come, bring the best art, because people wouldn't have come here. The collectors wouldn't have come without that, without that ingredient. And, and Sam worked on this very hard. You worked on this as well in Sam's footsteps in making sure that each year, only the finest galleries in the world are invited to participate in the fair and being as careful as you are to make sure that they're bringing the best quality art here to attract the collectors. Ella will tell you as a collector, I purchased many things at this fair here in Miami as I did in, 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 in Switzerland as well. That's what makes this fair a success, that it's a commercial success. Without it being a commercial success for the galleries, without it being worthwhile for the collectors to come here. It's not just a party here. It's, it, it's the quality of the fair itself. That's the, that's the ingredient for success. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put one more question to the panel and then we'll take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, audience members, start putting them in. Um, Ella, what surprised you the most about how the fair developed or how the week developed? What was the unexpected thing for you? Well, I think it, it was first uh, a little bit that the community in itself reacted that openly to the fair. Because being a commercial fair, you always think that, okay, it's a commercial fair, so you will have, you know, uh, collectors coming from outside, et cetera. But the community in itself, you know, the collectors and the, the museums, everybody reacted together towards the, uh, the fair, which was an effort, a community effort 
that I thought, you know, it's difficult to find maybe in a different city, you know. So that for me, it was a surprise and it made me rethink. I was just telling you before that, you know, to open my house was never an, an idea for me. And then suddenly all, you know, Norman, De La Cruz, everybody reacted so nicely to, to the people who were coming into the city that made me also rethink about, you know, then I opened the second venue, I opened C4 later on. Also, I think the, the quality of the, it raises so much the quality of the art that was being shown, you know, in Miami. It really gave a part, you know, a different perspective to the community of what is good art and what, you know, it raises the completely the view of, of what good art is in the community, yeah. you know. And um, that, you're, you're, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ella. No, that, no. that was really something that really, you know, also helped a lot. And, and I think it was a surprise, you know, to many, you know, that suddenly Miami wasn't that flimsy place into which, you know, little, little shows were shown. It, it really was a, a big, big change in that. Sam, you're you're a man who loves surprises. Oh, sorry, Norman. I was. Let me go to Sam quickly, and then I'll come back to you. Sam, what 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 surprised you the most, having worked on this so hard? Uh, three things. Number one, that it can be cold and rainy in Miami as well. <laughs> it happens only every ten years, but I think it happens. I still have the images in, in my mind of. Um, beautifully dressed um, women um, um, taking off their high heels and walking bare feet through the water <laughs> in Miami Beach. Um, I think the walking was actually something a lot of people enjoyed. To go to an American city where you can walk and where you, um, in walking, you discover, you meeting people. I think that is an element we know from going to the Ven uh, Venice Biennial or to our Basel, but it was also new to um, America. The second thing was the impact it had on uh, Latin America. Isabella Mora, who was a very important part of the, our Basel team, and I had went numerous times to Latin America. And so many artists and dealers and collectors told us that this fair had helped to, to bring attention to the great artists from that hemisphere. And today, um, in every gallery, every museum, many collections have artists from uh, Latin America. In the country, it became a natural thing and not anymore as it was done by the auction houses, where it was like separated, it was kind of a ghettoized, and that, that came together. The third thing that to me was a surprise um, was the crossover in of into other arts of course we wanted to connect the visual arts which didn't have a great tradition in miami to what was locally there which was architecture and design of course a great a great music scene and so on but the impact the um, um the visual arts because of, um, of our Basel Miami Beach, maybe also because of how welcoming it was for outsiders, for younger people, started to attract people from, from Hollywood, from the film business, from, um, from Silicon Valley, started to um, attract the major architects from around the world. Miami already had a great electronic music scene, but um, today our Basel is um, one of the places in the world where the most greatest DJs are playing in, uh, in, um, in this week and so on. And so I think that was something that we couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't have envisioned that the um, Miami miracle uh, went, went beyond the art world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the amazing things about Miami has been the degree to which it's become one of the events of the year where the entire creative class, not just of, of, the, of the of North America, but almost of Latin America and, and Europe comes together as well. Norman, I'm sorry, I cut you off. What surprised you the most? Uh, what surprised the, the, the success of the fair. 
I, I, I never, I, I, in my wildest dreams, I would have never imagined the effects that the fair had in terms of the community, in terms of the entire world of art, the collectors, I, uh, it went beyond, <laughs> it really went beyond. But you know, it, 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 as I said, the, the uh, MCH, the parent company of Art Basel, has really deserved so much credit for the investment, for the dedication. I mean, I mean, I mean, just think of it. Bob Goodman and uh, and Stephanie Reed, who worked with Sam uh, all the way back in this fair, are still here today, working with you, Mark, to make sure that this fair maintains the the quality level. Uh, and improving, even improving on that quality over a period of years. Success doesn't come by accident. It comes because of the dedication of the people who are involved in making, in, in making it a success. And it's a very delicate balance. And, but it, it, the, influence on, the influence on our community ha has been so profound and I believe will continue to be profound as far as the future is concerned. Yeah. To, to give credit where credit is due, um, you know, when Sam left in 2008, uh, my co-director, Annette Schoenholzer, who'd worked with him before, and I led that, led that for a long time. And then about five years ago, um, Noah Horwitz took over as a director of America. So, I mean, it's, in fact, Bob and Stephanie have worked, if, if you count Lorenzo with, I think, of, you know, half a dozen different Art Basel directors. And, and, you know, they've been real mainstays, you know, throughout this process. Um, I'm going to start with questions from the audience. And appropriately enough, since we're talking about the team, I'm going to start with a question from Lauren Toshin, who at the time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was living in Miami, worked very closely with Sam on events and other things. And her question is, what is your favorite memory from the early years? And again, Sam, I know this could take many, many years. But you know, if you could point to one moment, um, or maybe a couple of moments, you know, from that period that Lauren, of course, was working with you in the, in the very beginning, um, what comes to mind? Um, Lauren makes it very easy for me because she's been the one who um, who organized um, all of the um, all of the uh, events for our Basel. And one of my favorite um, memories is the. Um, um, that in the Benedict Hashan, um, now Lauren's husband, uh, the, then a friend, the, uh, the great publisher, he um, realized, he came to us and said, I'm doing a book, uh, I am, I'm doing a, a book on Muhammad Ali. And um, <sighs> Muhammad Ali won his first uh, uh, tight World Cup title um, in the same convention center where the fair is. And he had the amazing idea to stage, the, uh, um, stage an event there, which would bring Muhammad Ali and would bring a lot of other people um, from the black community, but also from the arts community together. And um, um, it was uh, it, it was it was mind blowing uh, to have this this cultural icon the, at the time the most photographed man on the earth as such a hero um, to come uh, to come there. And um, um, I think uh, that's one of my favorite memories. And it's also connected that it was not just um, something I'm very proud of that it happened, but something that is true for, for all of this. We became friends. Lauren and I became very close friends. Lauren married uh, Benedict Taschen, <laughs> Ella and I, Norman and Irma, we, um, we worked together, but we also became friends, and we had such uh, uh, many great um, me memories, which are impossible all to share. But um, I would, for, for, for nothing in the world, I would miss the time that we had together. Yeah, great. Um, Ella, do you have a, a favorite memory from the early years? Well, uh, I remember. Once we had uh, we had opened a C4, we had this opening, and um, <laughs> this was incredible. No, we thought that we were going to have for the opening. We had sent the invitations to the we thought to the VIPs, but there were different VIPs cards and things like that. And suddenly, 
there was an outcome of thousands of people and we were having this brunch for maybe a thousand eight hundred people and suddenly we had like three thousand people on the brunch and you know it was a disaster because i think how are we going to receive these people and we cannot tell them go away you know we can't so i mean it was a moment of terror but we came alone and uh, and the caterer was good enough to be able to manage but that was a, a something that was a, a terror day for me. And I think that during, you know, those openings, there was always something that we thought, you know, we tried to make the best, you know, we all, I think all the collectors tried to make the best we could to make this uh, happening, you know, to make the art Basel successful in every way. And uh, of course there were, in preparation, I'm sure that, you know, all of us who had public spaces open, we had a lot of surprises during, you know, all these openings and, and people who we never thought were going to come arrive suddenly, you know, and you had all these people. I mean, it, it's been a, a, a real roller coaster, but a great roller coaster, you know. Norman, last but not least. Mark, one, one more thing, if I may say so. That, uh, that I neglected to say, that the success for the future, the city of Miami Beach, uh, under the leadership of Dan Gelber and Jimmy Morales, city of Miami Beach invested $700 million in its, in its facility, in its convention facility, to make sure that Art Basel, Miami, Miami Beach, would have the perfect home for the future. $700 million investment by the taxpayers in the city of Miami Beach. Confidence in the, in Art Basel, Miami Beach for the future. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few people have asked similar questions. And, and I think, um, Sam, as you pointed out, the goal of Art Basel, Miami Beach was not just to do a, a thing around contemporary art or the visual arts, but also to be much broader. Um, and, you know, as Norman pointed out, we have, you know, two dozen plus parallel events, not to mention, or fairs, not to mention all the other events. I mean, you know, how do you view this, this, this sort of allegation, I guess, that, that you know, that it's become, it's, it's not enough about the art, that it's become a big party. I mean, I have my own view and I have my, I'll give my own response, but I mean, when you look at that, how do you think about this, you know? Sam, you're, you were the impresario, so, and you sort of, you, you let the dragon out of the cave. So how do you think about how things have evolved in Art Basel in, in, in Miami Beach? It was always about, uh, about art, but it was also about connect, uh, co connecting it to the community. And um, um, what obviously had happened um, that with the many people who came and with the let's say the vibrant atmosphere of Miami and the great weather, people want to party. <laughs> and uh, then uh, people, st uh, then some brands started to take advantage of it and, and, uh, and stayed in it. And it, it became also a business to make parties in Miami. That was never any of the goal. In the beginning, I think, as Ella beautifully described, you know, we were all overwhelmed and loved that, uh, uh, you know, sharing and spending time together. Afterwards, we were overwhelmed by it because people, there were people coming and they came for the parties and, and, and not for art. I think it took some, uh, it took an effort to um, kind of put the focus back uh, into art and, uh, and um, it has happened and uh, you have done a great job and, um, in recent years uh, to do that. But it was just a side effect, a collateral damage of the uh, um, of of um, of the success. And um, quite frankly, it's 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 important to to realize when you go to Miami, you have a lot more fun than in, in other places. And I wouldn't take no one wants to take that out. But at the core of the whole thing is art, and that should never be forgotten. I would also like to say that I remember um, meeting, I walk in in the design district 
and seeing all of these people um, 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 partying and wondering what that is. And I see a man in a wheelchair um, and he, he drives by me and I, think, oh, and I recognize, I, I think I know him. I turned around and I said, um, excuse me, are you Robert Rauschenberg? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I'm so surprised to see you here. He said, what a great party. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he came, made a point to come every year with, uh, uh, with his buddy, Ch uh, James Rosenquist, and they had a blast. And please don't forget, it's uh, the artists were an important part of it. And nothing of that would happen without the artists. We're all human beings, human beings. And even the, the, the great late John Baldessari, who famously said, artists shouldn't go to an art fair or, um, because it's like children walking you into your parents' bedroom, watching them having sex. Um, John Baldessari came every year and he loved it. And I think um, it helped uh, the, the, that it was such, uh, um, it was not just in a convention center, not just a trade show to also in, involve the artists. And uh, um, also artists love a good party. <laughs> yeah. um, I, we're, we're officially out of time. And I, I don't, but I, if Norman, Ella, do you have final thoughts you want to share? Because I think, Sam ended on a great note from his perspective. Well, I have to say that Art Basel really made me be better in the things I did. Each year, I tried my best to do better than last year in the shows that I was presenting, in what I was collecting. So I think as a, as a person, Art Battle made me really do better and be better. Thank you. Wow. Norman, I'm going to give you the last word, fittingly enough, since you were there from the beginning. No, I, I just, uh, I, I look forward to the future. I look forward to the next fair in, in, in Miami Beach and to the, the future of the fair um, and, and, and its continued excellence and its continued effect on our community and, um, and the collectors and just what it's brought not only to, to Miami, but to the entire uh, nation as well. Thank you. Great. I want to end by thanking all three of our panelists. It was a, a really special discussion. As Fran, as, uh, as uh, Sam said in, in, in the beginning, we, we could have taken hours for this, um, and maybe we will another time. Um, for those of you who'd like to watch this again, or for those of you who'd like to encourage our friends to watch it, the talk will be shortly uh, available on our Facebook channels and on our YouTube channels. Um, you can promote it over social media. Um, as we all know, uh, our Basel Miami Beach 2020 was the last of our three fairs that we canceled this year, but we have an online viewing room with the material for it. Um, we hope you'll get a chance to visit the fair virtually. There'll be a full program of conversations in coinciding with it. Um, I wish we could be there. Um, next year we will be. And um, I hope to see all of you there and especially the three panelists. So again, thank you very much to Ella, to Sam and to Norman. And thank you very much to the audience who joined us from all over the world. Good night, good afternoon, <laughs> have a nice day to the rest of you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, my.